so when I sent the title uh, of the talk, I didn't know uh, who the other invited speaker would be. And before I sent a very general uh, title, and then I learned that Zico was doing uh, something about you know, power grids. I knew that Dave was doing something on healthcare, which essentially canceled two thirds of my talk. So uh, what I'm gonna do is something a little bit different. And this is a quote by Tip O'Neill in the 1935 election in the US. And he was basically saying that all politics is local. So don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about the US election or the French election. They are way too, they are way too uh, depressing. But I think this quote applies to research very well. So I think also research is essentially very local uh, and, and driven by the interest of, of where you are. So I live in Michigan, and uh, there are three things that you need to know about Michigan. First, there are beautiful beaches, and that's a very well-kept secret. Uh, I send these pictures to my friends in Australia, and I ask them where this is located. And they always reply, in Australia, obviously. Uh, but this is actually on, the, on Lake Michigan, on the west side of the state. Uh, the other things that you need to know about Michigan is that uh, Detroit is located in that state. And Detroit has been motor city for a very long, long time. This is the, the, the home of the automotive industry in the US. And essentially, Detroit is trying to change itself now into what they call mobility city. And so if you do research in, in Michigan, you have to do research on transportation and mobility. And so that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to tell you what I think is evidence-based optimization. And then most of the talk is going to be on the new project that we have, which is about reinventing mobility and transportation. And so I'm going to give you some motivation for why we are doing you know, this kinds of research. Some of the new technology enablers, which I think are quite exciting. And then various, the, the big vision and various case studies that we have been uh, doing in the last couple of years and you know, very recently. And then I'll, I'll draw some conclusions about you know, the implication for constraint programming and, and why I think you know, this field is very nice uh, for constraint programming. Also, when I talk about the applications, I will also talk about some of the specific technique and optimization techniques that we are using in many of the pieces. Okay, uh, this is work with a lot of people. Uh, so people in Canberra, Phil Kilby, and my PhD students are to my, my EO. Uh, people in Melbourne who worked a lot on uh, evacuation uh, planning. So Victor, Caroline, Andreas, hopefully Andreas is here. Uh, and then uh, Julia Brown, uh, she just moved to MIT. And then uh, my team at Ann Arbor now, which is a lot of undergraduates and graduate students, and some people that I will introduce later on, but they are basically working in different services of the university. And the conclusion is joint work with Michaela and Michele. I see that Michaela is still dancing, so uh, she's gonna, not going to be here today. So this is what I call traditional optimization. And when you look at this picture, uh, so a lot of us has worked in, in fields like this. So this is a steel manufacturer. And there are two things that are interesting in this picture. First, it's a very controlled environment. So, so essentially, you know everything about this plant. So there is no uncertainty. And then the other thing, which is for me very striking at this point, is that there are no people in this picture. Okay? And so that's why I, I, I would call traditional optimization. You control completely the environments, and you don't have people to actually make the problem much more difficult. So what I call evidence-based optimization is you know, it's essentially optimizing over very complex infrastructure. I think DJ yesterday talked about complex systems, you know, the power grid, gas network, transportation network. That's exactly what I'm talking about. These are physical systems, but they also, they also are populated with people, and these people are basically affecting how the system is working, and they are susceptible to be damaged or to be affected by natural phenomena. And so when you optimize these things, you, you, you know, the, the problem is getting more complicated. Now you can tell me, but why didn't you work on some topics like this a long time ago? Because these systems were there. And the main reason is that what is new is that we have a lot more data. We have accumulated a lot of data on these systems, and we can do a lot more than we used to be able to do. Uh, why? Simply because these systems are much more instrumented. You have sensor almost everywhere. You can collect mobility data, for instance, in very substantial fashion. And so that, that's what I'm basically calling evidence-based you know, uh, optimization. You have a huge amount of data, and that's essentially informing how you can optimize the system. Okay, so I'm going to talk about you know, mobility, essentially, and transportation. And the first thing that I want to do is tell you why this is important. Obviously, I told you, you know, every, every research is kind of local, so the motivations are u really US basis. But many of the, many of the applications, many of the, many of the remarks that I'm going to do are applying to other, other countries as well. So, 
So in the US, car ownership, the, the fact that you own a car is the best predictor of social mobility. So it's, better, it's a better predictor than actually the crime rate in the neighborhood or you know, the quality of the school in the neighborhood. So if you own a car, you are much more likely to you know, progress uh, in, in, you know, in economic terms, in social terms in the United States. Uh, the same thing is true for healthcare. So about uh, 3.6 million uh, people in the United States have insurance, but they just don't, cannot get the care because they don't have the transportation means. So they have all the insurance, they can go to the doctor, but they don't know how to get there. So which is a pretty impressive number. And then the same thing is, is, also, is also true for you know, quality food and so on. In the United States, there are about 23 million, if I remember correctly, of people who don't have a supermarket within one mile of where they live, which basically means that most of the time they go shopping in convenience stores, which, is, you know, which they, they have a purpose, obviously, but this is not where you get a healthy diet. And so all these things are basically linked to transportation and mobility. So can you fix this? Okay, so to give you a sense, you know, there is a supermarket in Detroit, which is essentially offering a free Uber ride if you spend more than 50 bucks at the supermarket. So that's the extent of the, 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 the problem in the United States. So, so what, is plaguing, what is plaguing this transportation system? There are basically two things. So one of them is the first and the last mile problem. Okay, so this is getting to the transit system. So this is where I live in Ann Arbor. And I have two ways to get to work. Okay. Well, actually, this is one of the places where I have a lot of meetings. Okay? And so typically, my, my office is here. So it's much closer. But when I have to go to these meetings, I can take either the, you know, the public bus, okay, which basically takes about 30 minutes. Plus, you see, the, you see the frequency of that bus, 40 minutes, which basically means that, in average, I will wait 20 minutes, so 50 minutes to get there. Okay, so that's one way. The other one is take the UM bus system, and I will talk a lot about this system later on. But if I take this system, so I have to walk about 20 minutes and take this bus and get there also in about 50 minutes. If I take my car, it takes about 12 minutes. So that's a huge difference in terms of quality of service. The second thing that is important in, in transportation system and which is plaguing them is congestion. Okay, so in the United States, it's about $124 billion right now or two years ago. And it's going to go up, up to $200 billion in about you know, 10, 15 years. So the price of congestion, the time people spend in this you know, major, major gridlock, is increasing every year. And so this is one of the things that we need to fix. So, uh, so the questions that we are looking at is, can we actually shape this? Can we transform mobility in a scalable, sustainable, and replicable way? After hearing the banquet speech of Dave yesterday, I think I should have said, you know, added verified way and musical way or something like this. But this is what we want to do. Um, and so, so, so why, do, why do I think that we are in a good place to actually do this? So one of the reasons is that all, so we have connectivity. I think that's the most important driver be, behind everything here. So every vehicle snow is essentially connected. Every, every you know, they, connect, they, connect, they can connect to the infrastructure. The infrastructure is connected to various, it can be connected to various types of IP system, IT systems. So we have a lot of information about what is happening inside, inside the transportation system. So this is, you know, this is the main, the fundamental drivers that, that's going to make everything that I'm going to talk about possible. The second one is going to be automated vehicles. And uh, so this is essentially, so this is an enabler in the sense that it's going to reduce cost in a tremendous fashion. Okay, so I'll show you some figures in a moment uh, later on when I show you some of the case studies. Now, vehicle, automated vehicles have been there for a long time. This is a picture, I think, from the 50s. Uh, this is how they imagine this, is, you know, playing Scrabble inside the car. Uh, they are not yet there. So what I'm going to show you here is a small demo of a, of, a, of, a deep, of a deep learning system. And what you can see here, and this is what is preventing these cars to be in a heavy, you know, in a, in, in, inside very you know, heavily populated urban traffic, is that this car isn't being noticed by the system. So if this car is moving at that point, you know, that's how you get crashes. So we are very close, but we are not yet there. And so some of the things that we are trying to do is set up the right condition in which we can deploy actually these automated cars. Now, in Michigan, you have the summer that you have seen before. Oh, yeah, so that's continuing forever. So the other things that these cars have to be able to do, this is Michigan in the, in the, in the winter, you have to be able to you know, drive on ice, on snow, and so on. So this is work which is done by some of my colleagues in Michigan. And so in this particular case, that was a successful experiment. I have another one where they actually uh, swear a lot because the car essentially crashed. 
so that's the second driver, these automated cars. And you'll see that this is a cost, essentially, a, a cost benefit. The third thing is in analytics, and this is you know, the most relevant to this area. I think the progress that has been made in data science, in machine learning, and in optimization has been substantial. And this is a slide from Jean-François Puget that I borrow from him. And it's uh, telling you essentially all the stuff that you have to do for deploying a transportation system. You start by understanding the system, building predictive models, and then doing optimizations or mechanism design. And the more you move up and write, the more you talk about the future, and the more you automate the decisions. Uh, so this is a slide that I'm always using when I talk to people in transportation. This is a slide by my trick. I think it was at CPIOR in 2008. Basically saying that at that time, you know, if he had only optimization technology from 10 years ago, he couldn't schedule the Major League Baseball. And the, the second part of the, the slide is very nice for this community because he was saying these are the things that makes a difference practice. Complicated variables, and you'll see that I'm going to talk a lot about these things. Uh, large neighborhood search and then constraint programming ideally combined with integer programming. So what you're going to see is that many of these things have been amplified in the last eight years. And um, this is one of the things that is driving a lot of these applications. Uh, so let me tell you the vision about what we are trying to do. So uh, this is a project which is uh, in the context of the Data Science Institute of Michigan. So they have basically four track and one of them is transportation. And the key word here is data, as I told you before. We have a huge amount of data. We have terabytes of data that we are accumulating about these systems right now. And so this is the technical vision of the system. We basically view transportation as basically three layers. The lower layers is going to be the infrastructure. That's collecting information about the cars, about the infrastructure, how the roads are deteriorating. We want to connect with the traffic lights, the lane management. So we want to basically, so you have these big buses you'll see in Michigan. They are coming to these places. And then one person push a button and prevent these buses with 150 people in there to move for about a minute and a half. So that's not good. So we want to synchronize with these things as well. And the next layer is going to be the mobility layer. That's where we do a lot of the work. And the key point is to look at a variety of types of vehicles and trying to see how do you best combine them such that you get an, an efficient transit system, an on-demand transit system. And on top of that, you have to do a lot. You have to deal a lot with different kinds of policies. Urban planning, what you can do from an urban planning standpoint. You have to talk about people and how they're going to react to a system like that. So are they going to change the way they are behaving there, you know, and things, and things like this. And then obviously pricing and, and, and congestion. Okay? So that's the way we are viewing this. And every one of these layers is essentially interacting with all the other ones. And you are trying to optimize this system in a global fashion. Uh, so the, the things that we are doing right now is building this on-demand uh, multimodal transit system. So basically, we are looking at multiple fleets of vehicles uh, from uh, buses, light rail, uh, cars, obviously, bikes, and things like this, and putting them together. Uh, it's on-demand in the sense that you, know, you can order your traffic you know, using your phone and so, so on, so you don't have fixed road schedules. And then we want to do, obviously, since we control the entire system, we want to do con you know, congestion management and quality, of, and, and quality of service. And then, obviously, pricing is a big thing. Pricing is actually a bad word. It's, it's actually trying to influence people. Uh, but, this is, this is so, so, and, but, but you can also provide differentiated services. And then, obviously, you want to optimize that together with the infrastructure so that you maximize the use of your infrastructure. And I'll show you an example of that. So what we are building is taking these slides and filling in every one of these boxes and going from the very bottom to the top. So we want to build, you want to understand people and, and understand really in detail how they are behaving on a day-by-day -day basis, week-by-week -week -week basis. We want to understand how the infrastructure is used and what are the bottlenecks and so on and all the various assets that we have are basically used. And then we want to build predictive model. That's what we are doing for the travel demands from the inf you know, infrastructure deterioration and so on. These are mostly machine learning models at this point. And on top of that, we are building all these models, these optimization models for the design of the system, routing and dispatching, and then pricing. So that's what essentially the project is all about. So let me, let me tell you why we think it's possible. And so I'm going to first you know, give you a, a case study for Canberra and the techniques that we have used there for designing the system. And then I move to Ann Arbor and some of the, some of the things that we'll be uh, doing in congestion as well. So this is, uh, this is the capital city of Australia. For those of you who don't know Australia very well, they are two big cities, Melbourne and Sydney, and they hate each other. And so they had to build this capital in the middle of the desert in between them. Uh, it's a city which is built from scratch about 100 years ago. And it was built by this American architect, Walter Griffin, as, a, as kind of a, a, bush, a bush city, in the sense that every one of these things here is a little town that can almost survive on their own. They have their own supermarket. They have their own uh, 
uh, restaurant, they have their own gym, they have you know, their own post office, everything. And in between them, you have these green spaces, uh, which are, so, so that makes the city very, very green and very, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of empty space. So it's, it's very nice to move inside the city, it's very green, but from a transportation pro, you know, standpoint, it's actually very annoying. Why? Because the bus routes are extremely long, and therefore the frequency is very low, because the frequency is very low, people don't like to take these buses, and therefore the buses are running very empty, and therefore they cost a lot to the city, and nobody is happy. And so the project that we did there was essentially, um, uh, and this is with Phil Kilby and Arthur Mayo, one of my students, uh, is basically design a hub and shuttle, uh, a shuttle network. And the key idea is that you have very few hubs, okay, that you select, there are about 10 and 20 in camera, uh, that we are proposing. And so in between these hubs, you have high frequency buses. So very frequent, uh, about 10, 10 minutes uh, frequency. And so for bringing people to these, these hubs, you have basically taxi. What you have to understand also in Australia is that a huge amount of taxi, and these taxis are basically doing nothing most of the time, so it's, it, it's a good strategy for them to wait about two hours, two and a half hours at the airport to get the next ride. Okay, so these taxis most of the time don't do anything, and therefore you can use them for actually picking people up and then bringing them to a hub, then they take the bus, and other taxi is waiting to them, for them for bringing them to their destination. So the price of the system is going to be exactly the same. So you hop into the taxi, you, know, you, you order the taxi with your phone, they pick you up at the bus stop where you would take the bus normally, and then they bring you to the hub and then bring you to your destinations after you, you basically got to the next hub. So that's the, that's the design of the system. Uh, this is a visualization of, uh, of using real data of the proposed system. Uh, the big blue things are the buses. Uh, this is a hub. This is another hub. This is uh, north uh, west of the city. Uh, the, the little you know, green stuff are basically the taxi, and everything else are the, the, the bus stops. You have a huge amount of bus stops. So you see here, this bus is mostly empty, but it's going to get there to this hub where people are accumulating there, and then it's going to become you know, big. The, the bigger they are, the more people they are. So what you see, so you see now it's, it's, it's much bigger. Most of the people has been picked up. So what you see here is a nice synchronization between the taxi and essentially the, the buses that are connecting the various hubs with very high frequency. So that's the design of the system. Okay, so this is the cost of the system and the, the existing system and the new system. And there are two, and also the time that people spend in average traveling. So what you see here is that the time is essentially divided by two, and this is not a counting waiting because we don't know how long people wait, but if the buses are about an hour frequency, you can guess what the average is. Uh, so essentially, in general, you decrease the time by about a factor of two to three. This is the cost of the existing system. This is the cost of the new system. We didn't try to optimize that, but essentially you, you know, you're basically seeing that it's 10% lower. This is the price of the buses. We are basically removing a huge amount of bus lines, and so it's about 12% you know, you know, of the cost originally. Uh, so which means that most of this cost here is actually paying the taxi, and we pay full price in this model for the taxi. And the day we have automated car, uh, you know, a large portion of this is going to disappear. Okay, so that's where the automated vehicle part is coming from. But what you see here is dramatic improvement in quality of service, and also you keep the cost roughly the same, and it will decrease as soon as you have automated vehicles that are deployed. Okay, so how did we do this? So, uh, so there should be a live trial in 2016. It's a big negotiation. It's taking a long time. I can tell you that. Uh, but essentially, the key problems that we had to solve, one of the key problems is how to design this hub and shuttle system. So where do you locate the hubs, and how do you choose the links between the hub? And the key point is that, you know, you have to find out what are the segments in this network that are going to be served by buses, okay? And to do that, you essentially have to find out, you know, it depends on the origin and destination pairs of, you know, everyone traveling inside this network, okay? So the difficulty is that the routing depends on the bus routes, and you have to choose the routes, but, you know, bus routes knowing that you have to route these people across the network. So the, this, is the, this is a MIP model for actually capturing this. Now, I don't expect you to understand it, but I'm going to give you the, the, the key part of this model. So one of them is this part, okay? And so this is the cost of actually opening a bus line between H and L, which are two ups. Oh, I lost, yeah, okay. So, so this is when you design to build these links, and then the two other costs are the travel cost, okay? So moving from using a bus or using, or using a taxi for traveling this particular link between two points. Uh, the rest is essentially making sure that you can't travel a bus line if the bus line is not open, and then you have follow conservation that you have in almost all uh, uh, infrastructure uh, problems. 
So that's essentially the problem. Uh, so this problem is going to be very large because we have about you know, 20, 40,000 uh, OD pairs that we have to schedule in, inside this network uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, so what do we do? So there are a couple of things that you can do. The first thing, which is very interesting, is that about 30% of the, the trips are actually direct taxi trips. So you don't have to take the bus, which is nice from a convenience standpoint. It's also nice because it reduces the size of the problem tremendously, about a factor of, uh, about a term. Well, about, you know, you remove 30% of the complexity. The second thing that we are going to do is actually use, uh, recognize that in this particular problem, if you fix some of the variables, the problem becomes uh, easy. So if you look at the problem, this is how the problem is formulated in an abstract fashion. And these y variables are really the variables that you have to decide upon. Okay? They are what we call the surge variables. The other one are essentially the flows. Okay? Now, if you fix these guys, okay, then the whole problem becomes very nice. It becomes essentially a linear program that you can obviously solve very efficiently. So what we can do is decompose this problem in two parts, you know, the master problem, okay, and then the subproblems, and the subproblem is easy. So if I guess a Y, then I can solve this very easily, and I have a primal solution to the problem, okay? So, so what can we do with this? Okay, so essentially the, the, the way Bender's decomposition works is you start from the master problem, and the master problem is guessing completely randomly initially a network. And from that, you basically get a Bender's cut, which is going to tell you, ah, oh, this, this is the lower bound on everything that you can design, if the, you know, we, it, it, that you can design in the future. And then you generate another network, you get another Bender's cut, and you keep doing this until at some point the, the subproblem is going to give you an optimality proof. And this optimality proof is essentially when the master the problem and the subproblems have the same optimal value. Okay, so that's the the idea of of of, of Banner's decomposition. Okay, and so how do you do that in practice? The pra in practice, what you do is you take the subproblem and you dualize it. Okay, obviously we haven't done anything because these two problems are the same. But the interesting thing now is that these y variable, the search variables, are now in the objective functions, and the constraints are in there uh, expressed in terms of the dual variables. Okay, now it's a linear program, right? So it's easy. So which basically means that what you, can do, what you know is that one of the optimal solutions here is going to be located on a vertex of this, of this polyhedra. Okay? So you can enumerate all these vertices, okay? and then you can transform this particular problem into something which is, you know, get rid essentially of all the constraints. And the only thing that you get is the objective function. Okay? And so you have essentially removed all the, all the, all the subproblems variables. Okay? And what you get is that the subproblem becomes something like this. These guys are the you know, vertices of the polyhedra. Okay? And you are trying to minimize this Q such that it's greater than all these solutions. Okay? And they are expressed only in terms of these dual variables there. Um, you know, the, the, vertex, the vertices of the polyhedra and the, the search variable. So the master problem can be expressed in terms of the original objective function, except that we have Q there, and then these constraints, which are the Bander's cut. Obviously, you have, you know, exponentially many of these, in, you know, potentially, but obviously what we are doing is generating them on the fly by guessing these networks and getting these, these Bander's cuts back, okay? So this is, this, is one of the, this is the basis of, of, of Bender's decomposition. So one of the things that is very useful in practice is when these problems are actually, when you can actually, the subproblems is actually is separable. So it consists of a bunch of subproblems that are completely separated, okay? So when this is the case, you can solve these subproblems completely independently, and you can generate the Bender's cut also independently, okay? And this is obviously the case in this particular problem that we have. Why? Because this R variable represents the OD pairs. That's the people that you have to write about the network. And as you can see, we're summing over them. And then these, all these constraints are depending upon exactly the same R variables. They don't interfere with each other. So essentially, and so this is the only way they interfere. You have to build the bus route. So, but this is fixed by you know, the master problem. So essentially, we have a bunch of completely separated prob sub-problems that we have to solve. And most of them are actually flow problems or shortest path problem. So they are easy to solve. Okay? So this is the key idea. So if you only use that, that's not going to work very well because typically in Bender's decomposition, if the subproblem represents a flow, you will have a lot of redundant cuts. The, the, the cuts are, you're going to generate a huge amount of cuts. They are really similar to each other. So what you have to do is use this technique by McNenty and Wonk, which was also designed in the 70s or something like this. And the key idea there is what you want to generate cuts which are not dominated by other ones. So essentially, you want to, to find a cut which is stronger than all the cuts that you could generate from that particular subproblem. Okay? And so this is also easy to do in a sense you have to solve two linear programs to do that. Okay? 
And then the final thing that you can do is that now that all these problems are separable, you have a great opportunity to actually find out what kind of Banders cut you can decompose. And so you can generate the entire cut by aggregating all the cuts uh, for the subproblems, or you can do something better by exploiting the structure of the problem. So what we are doing here is looking at every one of the hubs, looking at the subproblems that are using some of these hubs, and aggregating the cuts in that particular fashion. And the benefits there is essentially you're linking this you know, master problem, the search value variables with some of the dual variables and getting a cut which is will capture some of the spatial structure of your network. So this is going to be a recurrent theme in this particular talk. So what we are doing essentially is using the sub-problem and exploiting its structure to generate cuts that are meaningful from a, from a structural standpoint. And I think that's a very interesting direction for CP and you'll see why later on. Okay, so this is kind of computational results for doing this. So this, these are the largest instance for the largest number of apps. And this is a logarithmic scale. So you see that the improvement in performance there compared to the original MIP is about, you know, a factor of two, two order of magnitudes improvement in efficiency. So these techniques make a lot of difference if you are trying to solve very large scale problems. Okay. So, so that's the, essentially the, the, the Canberra uh, uh, case study. And so what I want to do now is move to, um, is move to the Ann Arbor case study. Uh, so this is the city of Ann Arbor. This is actually the campus of the university. The, universe, the city itself is about 120 people, and then you add to that about 40,000 people, for, for, for 20,000 people, and you add to that 40,000 students uh, that are basically on campus. Uh, this is the city itself, so what I'm going to consider initially is what is between these highways, okay, so that's the main core of the city, and I'll talk a little bit about the border region in a moment. Uh, it's actually pretty nice from a nat nature standpoint, this is where I can run every morning. Um, but the interesting point about Ann Arbor is the transit system. Okay? So it's a very, very sophisticated transit system, both, both from the university standpoint. The university has its own bus uh, uh, system, and also from the city, which has also a, a very sophisticated transit system. Uh, it has the first mile and the last mile problem, okay? so that I mentioned before. And it has also, which is very nice, it has a lot of congestion. I mean, it's very nice from a technical standpoint, right? So, uh, so, so for the problems that we have to solve, it's very nice. Uh, so, as I told you, the, the, the university itself is running, about, uh, is running its own bus system, which is about $15 million a year for operating it. And it has a massive number, it has massive congestion issues and a lot of commuting. Actually, the commuting in, in Ann Arbor, although it's a kind of a city which is a quarter of the size of Canberra, is, is higher than in Canberra. There are about 50,000 commuting trips a day. About 7.5 million people are taking the bus every day. And it's used at 75% capacity in general. And on some of the lines, it's actually used more than 100%. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. The other thing which is interesting is that it has many peaks during the day. Uh, this is many peaks during the day. Uh, because the students are moving from different parts of the campus. And uh, they are basically, the, I'll show you the structure of the campus in a moment, but they have to travel between different parts of the campuses. Uh, so what you see here on this picture is actually the people who are trying to take the bus but are left out because the bus is completely overloaded with people. Okay? And you see the various peaks at different times of the day. That's when the various classes are starting and they have to move from one part of the campus to the other one. This is the overall structure of the campus. You have a medical campus here. Uh, which is about 20,000 people. You have about the North Campus where the College of Engineering is located and the Central Campus where the rest of the campus is located. You have the Athletic Campus on the side and this is mainly the, the, the downtown part of the city. Uh, I don't mean, you, you don't have to think that this is, these are the hubs and the links. I don't think that's actually a good solution, but it gives you the, think, the way people are thinking about this campus. Uh, the, the population is increasing all the time, uh, about 10% you know, in the last five or 10 years. And so what I'm going to show you now is essentially the transit system as how it's used. So what you see here is a density map of all the UM bus, the, all the buses, and there are about 60 buses that are being used on this campus. So the, 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 the more red it is, the more people are boarding this part of the buses. And so what you see here is this is basically downtown, the central campus. This is the, the north campus. You have a lot of transit between these two. Uh, and then you have the northeast, camp the northeast part of the campus there and the south campus over there. So this is at 8, 8.30, you know, 9, uh, 9.30. I'm putting a lot of slides there because I want to break my record of number of slides per hour at this point. <laughs> Uh, but this is, this is 10.30, this is 11. One of the things that, you know, when I was looking at this at the beginning, I noticed, obviously, is that there are various parts of the campus here where you have very low ridership. 
Actually, I live around here. Every time I see a bus, you know, when I came there, I was, you know, I was looking at these buses, and most of them were empty. Of, obviously, in this particular part of the campus, they are overloaded with people. Okay? But there are plenty of places like this or like here where essentially it doesn't make any sense to run a bus. Okay? And so, so what we are basically doing is replacing all this part with on-demand travel. Okay? And then we are moving also to this, this part of the community and those part of the community where we have a lot of people working, but there is no transit system for them. Okay? And that's one of the big things that we are trying to do. Get these people use the bus system or the on-demand travel system instead of you know, relying on cars. Okay? There are about 30,000 people parking in Ann Arbor you know, every day. Uh, so this is later on in the afternoon. Now, one of the things that I have to say is that this system is actually very well run. The, p the person actually running this came from FedEx, so he, he used to do a lot of logistic optimization. So you can see that he's matching well the demand for the buses with the demand, the, the, the demand in ridership. So, so it's, it's nicely operated. So we are not comparing with a system which is badly run. It's a system which is actually uh, very nicely run. Uh, this is the commuter north. This is one bus route which is heavily used, uh, probably the most popular uh, route used. But once again, you can see that there are various parts of the network where the demand is reasonably low. So this is 7 a.m., 8, 9, 9.30, 10, 10.30. So once again, there are places here, whoops, so 10.30, many places where the ridership is reasonably low. And that's what we want to replace, okay? So what we are doing is for this particular thing, we are developing everything that I told you before. We are building this, you know, building all the activity, understanding what people are doing on a day-by-day -day basis, building models for what people are doing in, on this campus, how the infrastructure is used, and building, you know, predictive models for the demand. So uh, we have some of them already. And then doing the routing and dispatching, and I'll show you something that we just got recently. So one of the things which is nice is that we can work directly with the university system, okay? So... Uh, Steve Dolan, who is operating uh, the, the network, is essentially a lot, you know, as I told you, somebody coming from FedEx, when I met him, I was like, wow, this guy actually understands what I'm talking about. So this is very nice, and therefore we have, for me, it's like a playground. So I can start playing with this system uh, because they let me do it. It's not like I have to negotiate with a city. Uh, we are working, so, so, but one of the things that, so they gave us terabytes of data. But you know, this is big data in practice. So they gave us terabytes of this, 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 the, the, of the information. But this, many of them come in terms of PDF files, okay, where you have essentially what is happening in these buses. Because the system is free, so you don't have actually cars that tell you when people are boarding or alighting. And therefore, they have these drivers actually taking notes of this. And then they report that, and we get the paper copy. So if you work in computer vision, and you can actually do that automatically, let me know. Because we have an army of undergraduate students actually filling this thing in a database, okay? So that's big data in practice. Uh, so we work also with the uh, information and technology services in, in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, so it's a big campus, so it's very well organized. So they have these applications that all the students have on their iPhones or their Android devices. And so they basically, you know, this is the life of all the students which in, in an app. And one of the things that you see here is the M bus. They can track the bus, you know, everywhere they are. And so what we are doing is developing all the apps and putting them there with these guys. So it's a, also a very nice opportunity because essentially we have professional people taking the prototypes that we have and building them inside the system. So one of the big things is that we are tracking everyone on campus. So we have these mobile apps for tracking people now. Uh, and so, so it's a massive number of information that we get all the time. So we have a, basically a cloud computing infrastructure to do that. So we start by getting these JSON requests. We automatically balance the system on, on the high performance cluster that we have at UMich. And then you have basically a Redis system to uh, make sure that the latency is very low. And then you store everything in, the, in a document database uh, that, that we can exploit for optimization and data analytics purposes. So once again, you know, the fact that you have these departments and this very high cluster is a huge benefit for us. We don't have to re-implement all this. And so most of this infrastructure, we can actually just specialize for what we do. Uh, so this is what we have to do on the campus. The campus is looking at completely renovating and reinventing the, 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 the transit system. And essentially, everything is on the table. One of the things that they are looking at is this light rail and elevated light rail such that you don't create congestion. So that's one of the things that they want us to look at. Uh, they have obviously these you know, big buses, uh, the blue buses. Um, that, we, that are basically operated right now. So we are looking at things like the Ford shuttle. This is a shuttle that can host about eight people. They are separated. It's not like people are bumping into each other. Uh, so they are done for this, this transit system. And then obviously automated cars uh, that can actually automate some part of the campus as well. Uh, and bikes which are very useful, very, very actually very useful during the, during the summer months. 
and uh, the, the, the spring bars. So this is a demo of the first version of the system that we, are, that we just got last week. Uh, you see this is the on-demand part of the north campus at this point. So we replace all the buses you know, on the north campus is by this shuttle. Now this is, uh, this is like 60 times accelerating. Okay? So you see all these shuttles moving now. And so what is interesting is that the numbers are actually much more amazing than in Canberra. So the, the, the decrease in cost is substantial because the demand is very low at, at various points and the ridership is much better. So we think we can get something like 40% decrease in, in price and improve at the same time the quality of service, such that we decrease these 15 minutes into something which is much closer to 20 uh, compared to the 12 minutes that you would take by car. So this was just, so most of the things here are not completely optimized. We have a lot of work to do on the optimization problems. The optimization problems are very difficult because there, there are a lot of congestions that you have to avoid here. Uh, but this is, this is the first step and hopefully we'll report a lot of results on this uh, in the coming months. Uh, one of the things that you, so when we design this network, we cannot do what we did for Canberra because there is significant congestion, okay? Uh, so, so the network was taken into account the capacity constraints on all, a lot of the roads, and that is to essentially means that we have inside the design of the system taken into account routing and scheduling. And this is one of the things which is beautiful for constraint programming. Uh, why? Because essentially, no, you have to capture this congestion, and therefore you cannot decompose the problem nicely, and these congestions are kind of scheduling constraints. So what do we use? There are many things that we can use. We can use logical banders decomposition that was basically uh, done, you know, proposed by John Hooker in the first you know, constraint programming workshop in 94. Uh, or we can use some of the other things that we have been doing recently, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, branch and price and check, which can be seen as a as, a, as you know, kind of a generalization of what John has been doing on, on Bender's decomposition and branch and check. So I'm going to illustrate that on something which, is, which, we, you know, which we have done uh, recently as well, which is VRP with precedence constraints. Pre pre presence constraints. And so the way to think about this is that you have a traditional VRP where you have multiple vehicles that you have to schedule. Uh, you have pickup and delivery constraint, which is essentially what we do in transportation. And then you have time windows, which are basically specifying when you can pick up the pe uh, people. And then you have capacity constraints on the vehicles. And you may have different types of vehicles, obviously. But the key, the key interesting part here is that you have presence constraints. And I'm going to tell you what they are. But think about, you know, this is, this is, this, we started working on these problems because of problems in uh, you, you know, humanitarian logistic and military logistic, where essentially you have these big operations and they have to land on a particular airport, but you have limits on how much, you, how much airplanes can actually land on the airport or how much airplanes can actually uh, park at the airport. So what we did was actually, so this is, this is a visual representation of this. So you have this, this is a traditional vehicle routing where you have requests that you have to pick up. And then uh, what we are doing is generalizing that with the concept of location. So there may be multiple requests at a particular location, but the concept of location is important. And you put some constraints on the location. You could also put constraints on the links, which is what we need in transportation, obviously. And so you can say, for instance, that at any particular point in time, at a particular location, you can only serve two requests. Okay? And so now you have to solve these problems with all these constraints of the VRP plus these presence constraints, which are basically saying that at a particular location, you can only serve two requests. Okay, so essentially you have all the constraints of a VRP plus essentially these cumulative constraints on every one of the location. And the cumulative constraints are going to say, oh, if you, the vehicles arrive at a particular, the number of vehicles arriving at a particular point in time, and for the time that they are actually staying at that particular location, uh, they, cannot, you know, they can only be, you know, only, you know, a certain number of them at any one time. Okay, so that's what we are doing. And so you can solve these problems in a variety of ways. You can use a MIP, and typically you would have to use logical constraints for expressing these cumulative constraints because the time index formulations are not going to scale. These are very large scale problems, and the time, is, the time horizon is long. And then, or, or, very, or you have very fine, grain, gran, very fine granularity that you have to optimize over. We can use that, we can use CP to do that using a VRP and cumulative constraints. So we can use, you know, this thing that we just proposed, which is branch and price and check, and which I'm going to explain to you. But the key point here is that you're going to have a branch and price algorithm, something column generation, but with, but with branching. And in addition to that, we're going to use CP for checking the cumulative constraints. So let me give you a picture of what the algorithm does at a high level. So you have basically three problems, okay? So you have a master problem, you have a pricing problem, and you have a checking problem. And if you're lucky, you're going to get a solution, okay? So the master problem uh, is going to basically uh, solve, solve, its, you know, solve itself and then send this dual to the, to the pricing problem. And the pricing problem is going to send back, a, oops, a set of routes, okay? So 
Yes, and so from this set of rows, okay, so you're gonna give, you're gonna get new dual variables on the master problem. So you're gonna send back to the pricing problem, you know, a column generation problem, which is gonna send another, another set of rows, okay? And at some point, some of these rows are gonna have integer values. So the master problem is gonna select, really select them. They are not gonna have a fractional value. At that particular point, you, you, you take them and you send them to the, to the pricing, the, the checking problem, which is a CP problem, a CP, a CP model. And the CP model is gonna say, oh, are these rows compatible with the presence constraint, okay? And if they are not, okay, so this particular subproblem is gonna send a bender scat to the master problem, which is gonna re-optimize and then try other rows. And at some point, these rows are gonna be feasible. And what you're gonna do essentially is take the solution to the master problems, add the scheduling, which is done by the checking problems, and know you have a solution, okay? And you iterate this until you find the optimal solution. Okay, so that's the key idea of brands and price and check. Okay, so the high level, the master problem is amazingly simple. The only thing that you are doing is operating on the routes. The routes capture all the vehicle routing constraints, essentially. And so, so you have the routes over there. So this is whether you select a route or not, you have the cost of the route. Then essentially you have to make sure that every one of the pickup have to be covered by exactly one route. And then you have this bender scale that I'm gonna talk about later on that you're generating from the checking subproblems. Okay, so the pricing problem is a typical is a typical labeling problem for finding you know constraint shortest path. So nothing new there. It's very typical of what they do in uh, in branch and cut algorithm these days. And then the checking problem is a beautiful CP problem, which has two components, a routing component, oops, what you would do typically in routing. So you basically reason about the arrival time of a vehicle, which has to be before you can serve it. And then uh, the serving time plus the, the, the time to, the, 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 the start of the serving time plus the time it takes to service the, the, particular, the particular request is gonna, you know, you have to make sure that the, depart and the, the, the departure time is after that. And then you are making sure that uh, essentially the success of that particular, that that particular location or that particular pickup request is going to be, you know, after the departure time and the time that it takes to actually move to the successor. And then, so this is the routing part, and then you have the cumulative constraint that I've mentioned before to make sure that there are no more, so you can only serve that many requests at a particular location at a particular time, okay? So it's a combination of routing and scheduling that you have to do, okay? So the bender scars are very interesting. When the subproblem is infeasible, this is the bender scars that you are sending, okay? So the bender scars here takes, you know, the number of, of arcs that you use in all these rows that are infeasible, okay, minus one, because you want to get a cut. And then what you have is that for all the rows, you count the number of arcs that they are using in this particular infeasible rows, and the sum of these things has to be smaller than this. That's the bender scale that you are using, okay? It captures some of the structure of these rows and, and th that are infeasible, and then, you know, kind of lift them to the entire problem. Now, there is a much more simpler cut that you could generate, okay? But that simpler cut will never converge. It's like the beautiful dancing cut that you have in, uh, in cutting planes theory is beautiful, but it never converges. So the simpler cut that exists, you can think about what you would do if you had to generate a simpler cut, is not gonna converge here because of the fact that we are in a column generation algorithm. Okay, so let me show you some results. So I'm gonna compare a MIP system solved with Gurabi, a CP system solved, you know, solved with Shaft, and then the branch and price algorithm there. So this is 10 pickups, okay, and then you can see here is that essentially the branch and price and check takes almost no time. Uh, the MIP is already taking substantial time. CP is taking substantial time as well. When you move to 20 requests, essentially everybody dies except the branch and price algorithm. And this is, you know, 40 requests, or, you know, 20 pickups, uh, 20 deliveries. Uh, even the MIP cannot solve these problems so optimally. CP is you know, not doing anything on these particular problems either. This is what is most interesting when you are scaling. This is about 160 requests. Uh, the only, the only problems, the only uh, approach which is actually scaling is the branch and price and check. Uh, CP is only very good when you are, can actually have a very strong uh, cumulative constraints, uh, essentially one unit. Uh, so essentially one, one, one request can be served at the same time. But the fact that it can do that is also why we can actually do this branch and, and price. So checking feasibility is very, very efficient with CP here and is a big part of this branch and price and check. Okay, so essentially you can scale to essentially mid-sized instances at this point using these techniques and nothing else can actually scale to that at this point. Uh, so this is one of the techniques that we are using now for designing the network in Ann Arbor. 
Uh, the other things that uh, we are using is obviously something that we have done about 15 years ago and that I had completely forgotten until you know, we started doing this, which is online stochastic optimization. The combination of essentially using a predictive model and then using optimization. And so I want to show you a video that we did about 10 years ago, uh, which is very relevant now. So this is essentially the, the power of showing you the combination of machine learning and optimization. And so what I'm going to show you here is a pickup and, and a pickup and a delivery problem uh, where you see all these vehicles and they have to pick up these requests that are coming during the day. Okay? So some of you may have seen this 10 years ago. And so what you see here is that if you use only optimization and optimize online all the time, as soon as you have a request, you are essentially going to miss about a third of the customers. So some of these regions are very difficult to serve, as you can see, and essentially about a third of the requests are going to be, uh, are going to be rejected. So what is very interesting is what you do when you are actually using a predictive model predicting what the demand is going to be. And this is the data that we now have for Ann Arbor. So you see these vehicles, some of them are dispatched at very wrong location and they are going to move afterwards because we are basically anticipating where the requests are going to be. And the beautiful thing here is that essentially you reject only about two customers in this particular instance. Uh, but what is interesting is what the algorithm does behind the scenes. So you see the routing here, which is optimized, and the plan there is what we are you know, planning to do. And as you can see, it's changing all the time based on the information that we have. So you, you have these predictive models, and then you have the demand in practice, and then you say, oh, the demand is not exactly what I expected, no, and then you re-optimize. But you re-optimize based on the stochastic information that we have. So this is what we are going to use now that we will have all the activity-based model of everybody on campus. So we'll know where we can expect people and what we expect them to do at various points in the day. Okay? Uh, so this is the next step of the project where we are fin finalizing the campus. So, so this is the broader Ann Arbor region. And once again, what I'm showing you is the, is the data of the buses, the transit system for the Ann Arbor region. And this is actually a lot more complicated. Uh, you can see that there is ridership at various places. This is a, this is a neighboring town called Ypsilanti. This is uh, downtown Ann Arbor. Obviously, you see that some of the high-frequency buses are going to be located there. Uh, but it's very unclear you know, what the optimization is going to give us on some of the other regions, particularly here or particularly there. Uh, but this is also over time what you see in the system there. But once again, you, know, you see the ridership here. So uh, you see the ridership there. We have a lot of potential for on-demand transportation. Once again, it's a very well-operated system. They match very well the bus frequency with the demand. Um, <coughs> but like the bus system in, in the, in the, in the, on the campus, most of the ridership is actually very low at different, part, at different times of the day. Uh, this, is, this is something that we learn again, you know, again and again. So they, sometimes you need to look at the data because there are some really interesting things. So we were looking at this thing here, and there was a lot of ridership. We had no clue what this was. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And so since I knew in Michigan, I had no clue what this was. But this is actually another university, which is called Eastern Michigan University. And what you see there is essentially a, a bus running across the campus there. So this is interesting what you see from the data from time to time. Uh, we obviously have all the census data we know for every one of the blocks, how many people live there, how many cars they have, what, what's the level of income of everyone. And as you can see, the system is actually reasonably well designed with respect to the census data. But once again, this is a population here where there are a lot of people you know, living. Uh, the bus system here is very weakly used, and so which basically means that most of these people are actually commuting by cars to the, to the city. Uh, so that's one of the things that we want to automate there. Uh, this is an animation, once again, of the system running. Obviously, this is, you know, highly, you know, uh, the speed is much higher than normal. But once again, what you're going to see is that, you know, the, the buses have a very, very low frequency for summing some of these areas, even some of these areas over there. And that's a big issue because that basically means that these people have very little incentive to use that. This is the boarding of the various people uh, in time over the day. Uh, once again, we have a lot of data from these guys uh, from actually... Uh, looking at everything which is happening in the system. But you can see that the ridership in various places here is very, very low, except obviously on the main, on the main, on the main uh, axis. So, so this is essentially the, the part where we'll do the, uh, the multimodal system. What I want to talk about a little bit now is, is congestion management and the ideas that we have to do that. And so I talked about the rush hours. So this is in Washington, D.C., uh, in Michigan, we have this beautiful stadium. It's one, 110,000 people. This is the largest football stadium in the country. And so there are games every Saturday. And this is a big evacuation problem, obviously. And so every time, every time I give talks on evacuation, people are telling me, why don't you apply that to congestion? And so this is, you know, I'm going to show you the, the work on evacuation planning, because this is essentially what we are doing now for uh, 
uh, congestion management, the IDs are very much the same, except that we control people a little bit less, but this is also what is interesting. Uh, so this is a project that we did in Sydney again. And so, it's, so the west part of Sydney here is a floodplain. These are the Blue Mountains, which is a catchment area. That's where precipitation are accumulating. And so in between these two things, oops, in between these two things, we have the Warangamba Dam. And this dam is uh, essentially uh, spinning over every, every now and then. And people are very worried. So these are recent reports saying uh, it's very dangerous. If this, this dam spills over in a massive way or if it breaks a little, then you have a real catastrophe for the western part of Sydney. Uh, this is last year in August. Uh, it was spilling over. And if there had been a flash flood or a significant uh, flood at that time, it would have been a real disaster. August is uh, winter in Australia, right? Uh, why? Because this is essentially a pipe to the city, a pipeline to the city. You can see this river is essentially, you know, if this dam breaks, it's like you are flushing this water inside West Sydney. Uh, so this is all you don't want to do, uh, evacuation. Uh, this is essentially uh, uh, one year before Katrina, and that's, where, that's how they were organizing the, the evacuation during retide, close to Houston. Uh, and once again, you have a very large capacity, and you are only using half of it. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So we had a lot of data again, so all the GIS data, all the traffic data as well. We had, a, we had simulation model for the flood as well. So this is a simulation of the flood. Uh, it's basically, so basically what we can get is very precise information about when a flood is reaching a zone uh, and, 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 the, and also the elevation of the water so that you know which roads are going to be usable, which bridges are going to be usable, and so on. Uh, so what you do typically is you take this region, you discretize it, you get a big network. Uh, this is the network in practice. And then you have to ship people across this network, essentially. You have to bring them from a particular origin to a particular destination using the transportation network that you have. Some of the nodes are not available because they, they, are, they are flooded and you can't use them. Uh, so, so you have to decide you know, when to evacuate, where to evacuate, and how to evacuate. And you have obviously to maximize the number of people that you evacuate. Uh, one of the constraints that they have is that you have to use the same route for all the people living in the same residential area which is making the optimization problem much more difficult. But in practice, this is what you want to do, because you want to tell a particular zone this is where you have to go and how you have to go there uh, and when you have to leave. So this is why they do that in practice. Uh, so obviously, this is optimization about the complex infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, human behavior. And I will talk about that in a moment, and then a natural phenomena. Uh, so if you try to solve this, you take this, you discretize it, let's say for five minute steps, you get this huge MIP. Okay, which is about 4 million decision variables. If you send it to state-of-the-art software, they die at the root node, so they can't actually touch this. So, so let me show you first the, you know, the demo. And so this demo was done for the emergency services at a New South Wales, and was basically showing the power of optimization. So what you see in this first part, you see the flood there. You see essentially the, the, the yellow stuff are the roads that are blocked. Okay? And you see people evacuating, obviously. So this is showing you what they, do, what they would do in a, in, with, with the system that they had about three years ago. So they actually, they actually basically tell people what to do and well, when they have to evacuate, and then people are basically are free to choose where they go, okay? And they use basically shortest path to go, you know, where they want. And so essentially, if they do that, about 11,000 people are going to be uh, are going to be stuck. Now, these are good people, right? So they have papers in disaster management and so on. They have a timeline that they did trying to into, take into account the transportation system. It's not once again, it's not a bad. It was not a bad uh, a bad evacuation plan. But obviously, they don't optimize. They don't, they, they don't optimize, and they don't look at the transportation system globally. So this is when you optimize. And what you're going to see is essentially that what we do is we time the evacuation very differently. And we are also using the transportation system much more widely, many roads that they are not using, so that we can distribute the load much better, and we can avoid congestion. And obviously, we can evacuate everyone. Otherwise, I wouldn't be showing you this demo, right? <laughs> Uh, so this is New Orleans. Uh, so we did the same thing for New Orleans. So I'm going to go very fast on this. But essentially, what I want to show you is that uh, we can scale this to very large numbers of people. This is a million people. We can evacuate them in about 37 hours, which is better than what they did in, in the past. And we use contra flow on the main road. So we choose which roads uh, we are using in a, in a, way, uh, in a way where uh, essentially the two sides of the highway or the two sides of the roads are going in the same direction. Because when you, go, when you do evacuation, you, you move people out or you move people in. But. And so essentially, we can do that. You know, the, the, the algorithm, it takes, takes about 20 minutes to do something like this. Uh, now, 
there are two things that you have to take into account when you do these things. So the first thing is that you have to make sure that the emergency services are happy. And then you have to take into account uh, 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 human behavior. So this is an evacuation uh, uh, which was also done a year before Katrina. And what you see here is a contra flow. So that people can go to the other side of the highway or they can stay here and go, and go in front. And one of the things that you see here is that you have congestion just before the fork. But after the fork, you see almost nobody. Okay? So why? Okay? So you should have more capacity, but you have congestion here and almost no car over there. And there are two reasons. So first, people are slowing down because some of them have to turn. And the other one are just slowing down because they are wondering what they can do. They can go on the left or they can do on the right. When people do that, they slow down because they have to face a decision. This is well known in social science. And therefore, you start slowing down everybody. And since you were using this at almost full capacity, okay, before the break, breakdown point, you slow down and you create this breakdown and congestion. So you don't want this thing to happen. So what we did was designing what we call convergent plan. And these are plans where we don't have a fork. People have no choice. They, have to, they, they always go into one particular point. They not, never slow down because essentially they have no options. And so these are the plans that we love because not only people don't have a choice, but at the same time, also we can use contra flow automatically everywhere. Okay? So, and that's one of the things that we design. And once again, when you look at this, this is very nice because this is something where you have search variables and then the rest is essentially a big flow problem. Okay? And so you can use Bender's decomposition, and what you can see is that you can get high quality solution very, very quickly with a few optimization. And then most of the time is actually spent, is, is basically spent proving optimality. So these are some of the results here. And what you can see is that, you know, even if we increase the population in the area by 70%, we can evacuate almost everyone all the time, depending upon the time that we have as a warning uh, when the, the dam is breaking. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated, but we are within 1% of optimality in general if you, move to, if you double the population, which is likely to happen in that particular part of Sydney. Uh, so what I want to show you now is, once again, an animation of what is happening when you are using this uh, conversion plan. So this is work that we did earlier this year. Uh, actually, it's very, it's very interesting, right? So you see these little ants moving everywhere. Uh, but these are conversion plan. One of the things that I want you to look at is, is this part. Okay? So you see, oh, you know, a lot of cars are leaving at that particular point, and then one car and then another car, and then nothing, nothing, and then another car. And so when you show that to people in emergency service, they say, you are crazy, right? Because they will never be able to actually do something like this, OK? So, so essentially what they want is they, they, don't, they don't want an evacuation where you, know, you have an optimal solution, but you evacuate a little bit, and then you stop. And then you evacuate a little bit, and then you stop this car. You evacuate a little bit, and then you stop these cars. They don't want that. What they want is essentially when you start evacuating, you have a flow rate, and you basically follow that particular flow rate until everybody is evacuated. That you can do. Otherwise, you have to deal with you know, people, and they're going to be extremely unhappy. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you have to have a non-preemptive scheduling now instead of having a preemptive scheduling problem, and that's much more complicated. But that's also when constraint programming is very nice. Okay, so we basically did, and this is work with Andreas uh, and 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 Caroline, and so we basically modeled this as a complicated scheduling problems because essentially the flow rate is also a variable. But essentially, what you have is a bunch of precedent constraints and then a bunch of cumulative constraints as well. Uh, so this is essentially the flow model. It's very abstract, but it's actually computationally interesting. Uh, and then we can actually, in practice, decompose that because the, the conversion plan is things that are really separa separable as well. And therefore, when you get the Bender's cut, they are going to be located to particular routes, which is also very good. And one of the interesting things is that when you do that, you lose a little bit. You, don't, you, you cannot evacuate as many people, but very little in a sense. So the, the, the cost of non-preemption is not that big. Okay, and so we should really, so we lose sometimes when it's very heavily, when the population increase very much, we lose about 4%. But at least we have a plan which is actually, uh, which can actually be implemented. Okay, so and we have nice region. This is only seven of the region, but now you can see that the region is evacuated in a continuous fashion. Okay, so let me conclude because I want to talk a little bit about the implication for constraint programming. Uh, so what we do is system-wide optimization. I talked a lot about mobility and transportation, but the other area I'm working a lot is electric energy system. But since Zico had talked about this, I, I didn't want to talk about it. Um, but uh, an interesting thing about most of these applications is that they, they almost always know these days combine some strategic planning with tactical planning and operations. Okay? And so you have this vertical integration where you want to make decisions at the strategic level, but the only way they can be meaningful is that if you take into account the operations. 
And so you have a problem which becomes very complex there and typically involves a MIP at the, at the higher level and then involves some combinatorics at the lower level, routing and scheduling, and this is where CP is very good. And so many of the things that I think CP has a lot of values is that it's going to be, you know, the technology of choice for these sub problems and obviously during operations. But in this big, 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 you know, strategic planning and together with operational, you know, consideration, CP is an ideal place for actually doing, you know, uh, b b basically be used as, as a, a building block for the sub problem. Uh, the other things, obviously, that I mentioned is that we have to integrate the predictive model of the machine learning problems and the optimization problems. And one of the things that we are doing, you know, with Michaela and Michele is, you know, looking at models where the predictive model, in a sense, has, has, has input the search variables. So, and that means that essentially what you have to do is integrating the predictive model inside the optimization. And this is, in general, difficult to do. But this is where a lot of values is going to be located for some of these infrastructure optimization problems. And so what is this predictive model? It can be modeling a, you know, a, a very complex physical phenomena, like a flood. So these are typically very nonlinear equations. And what you want to do is get a good approximation of them so that you can op optimize over them. And this is some of the things that we are doing in the, in the flood context. Also, abstraction of human behavior. We want to have models of human behavior that we can reason about. And then, obviously, abstractions of complex infrastructure. Uh, so this is an example. So this is a highway in Germany, uh, basically. A, 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 so it's, it's near Cologne. It's about two lanes in one direction. And what you're looking at is essentially the relationship between the speed of the car and the flow rates of the vehicles. And so at some particular point, you can travel 100 you know, kilometers an hour. But at some point, there is this breakdown point which is happening. And you can have these breakdowns, and then the, the, the speed is going to decrease substantially. So we have to basically work with distribution like this. And if you want to go inside this region, you have to know that you have a certain probability of having a breakdown. Or you can you know, you know, make sure that the system is operating only in the safe zone. So this is what we have to be able to reason about. We have to reason about distributions like that. And they should be essentially constraints inside your pro constraint programming system. So what I see as a really nice direction for CP is that you can put inside the global constraints the predictive model and reason about it. And so this is, the, this is also an opportunity in this big infrastructure optimization problem. The main challenge is obviously scalability. So one of the big things that we want to do is apply these techniques to Detroit. Uh, Detroit is a city which, is, which has a lot of challenges. Uh, so the car ownership is one of the lowest in the United States, uh, which basically means that social mobility is very low. Uh, the job opportunities are very, very bizarre. They are uh, essentially a lot of people live in the city and they have to move out of the city to get to the job. And obviously, uh, equally as many people are actually outside the city and moving to the city. So it's kind of a difficult uh, transportation system. The poverty level is extremely high, and that is consequence in, on what we can do. And then the employment rate is also very, very low. So it's a, kind of a scary city. Uh, but one of, so, so a lot of challenges, and there are basically two challenges. The algorithm has to scale to the city like that, uh, which is not obvious. And then there is also challenges in data. Many of these people don't have a cell phone. They don't have a smartphone. Therefore, you don't have the tracking of the data that we have in an arbor. And so that's going to be a challenge as well. And so we are thinking about how we can address those challenges at this point. Uh, so I want, to, I, want to, I want to conclude by a note on... Uh, on on telling you that all of this thing is very, uh, so a very sobering story. So when I took, the first time I took to the city of Ann Arbor, so I met this guy, Chris White, which is essentially operating the system. And then it's, it told me, oh, but you know, what you're doing is interesting. We have been investigating on-demand transportation. And I say, oh, really, that's great. You know, maybe you know, we can do something together. And then he gave me this report uh, that they actually produce. And the interesting thing about these reports is the date. And so this is the date. Okay, so they were essentially investigating on-demand transportation in 75. And obviously they didn't have the technology, right? They were scheduling everything by phone. And so these people are basically saying, well, you know, this ID worked very well. I mean, we had to show that it was scalable. Uh, but the problem is that we didn't have all this data. And so once again, you know, so we are reinventing something that people have been inventing for a long time. But I think what is making a big difference is the drivers that I mentioned at the beginning. The fact that the vehicles are connected, that we have automated vehicles, and then that we have data science. And you know, in several of these problems, you know, constraint programming has a big role to play. And that's what, I'm, you know, that's what I wanted to tell you today. So thank you very much.